Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Judge Russ Rotha of the San Francisco Superior Court, and I'll be your moderator of today's program, Demystifying the Judicial Appointment Process. The California Judicial Mentor Program is a collaboration between the executive and judicial branches of the state of California. The program was initially launched as a pilot program of the Los Angeles County Superior Court where there are more than 500 judicial officers. The program in LA County has been a tremendous success. It is now approaching a fully statewide judicial mentor program. I've had the honor to serve on the executive committee of the statewide program this past year. Our program today is sponsored by the Bay Area Judicial Mentor Programs of Alameda County, Contra Costa County, Monterey County, San Benito, San Francisco, San Mateo, Santa Cruz, and Santa Clara County Superior Courts. Other counties have also coordinated their programs. For example, Marin County, Sonoma County, Napa County, and Solano County Superior Courts are coordinating and implementing their own programs. Our Bay Area program has undertaken an expanded outreach to local specialty minority bar associations, the Minority Bar Coalition, nonprofit organizations and legal service organizations to spread the word. We're also pleased that more than 260 individuals registered for today's program. We urge all attendees after this program to spread the word and the availability of just the judicial mentor program. The purpose of the program is to assist in the recruitment and development of a pool of qualified inclusive and diverse judicial applicants for the courts of California. The program it, itself, the, the, the program matches an attorney licensed to practice, interested in applying to become a judge to a mentor judge who can help demystify the application process. The program seeks to improve transparency and accessibility for all members of the legal community who are interested in serving on the Superior Court. Now, the goal is to increase the pool of applicants for appointment to the judicial branch with the shared goal of a judiciary in California that truly is reflective of the rich diversity of this state. We hope to encourage and motivate qualified and diverse candidates diverse in every sense of the term, to apply for judicial appointment and hit that submit button. Now, as the title of this web webinar suggests, the mentor program is designed to demystify and increase transparency in the appointment process and to open the process to all maybe who may be considering a judicial career. Judicial mentors will encourage their mentee candidates to be authentic, tell their own story. Mentees will engage with judges who have had their own stories, their own career paths. It is to be a supportive and confidential relationship to encourage future applicants. Now we have a great lineup of speakers here today. You know most of them. We very much respect your time and intend to move this program along efficiently. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the program. You can leave a question in the question and answer box and the questions will be monitored and we will try to answer each of your questions as, as best we can at the end of the program. And by all means, if your question is not answered, you can reach out to any one of the programs in our eight participating counties for further information. Contact information will be sent to you Following the program, printed material containing county by county program contact information will be sent to you as part of a thank you for your participating here today. Finally, you should know, this is just the official launch of the Bay Area Judicial Mentor Program. We intend to be available to bar associations, affinity groups, practice specialty groups, nonprofits and others and an ongoing effort to provide webinars when you feel it will be useful to your membership. 
our mentor program does not replace or duplicate Affinity Bar mentor programs, but rather works synergistically. Our unique goal is to increase the pool of applicants for appointment to the court. And now it is my great and distinct pleasure and honor to introduce to you the Chief Justice of the State of California, the Honorable Tani Kantil Sakaue. Chief. Thank you, Judge Roca, and thank you, my deep gratitude and respect to the panelists and to the Bay Area counties that are carrying this forward and spreading the word. I just want to say a few things, and that is, I am an unlikely Chief Justice. I look like no other Chief Justice in the United States or the three territories, but I thank my my role goes to all the mentors and mentees before that word was introduced back in the 1980s to the people who helped me along this path for me to see myself as a judicial officer and to apply and who gave me support. One of those is your speaker tonight, Luis Cespedes, when out of Sacramento in the 80s, he and many others like Luis saw the future of the judiciary and said, you should apply. And of course, my reaction was much like yours. Are you kidding? But of course, with the support of your barge and now judicial officers, the possibilities are endless. And also I am proud to be part of a rich tradition in the judiciary because the lawyers and the judges, at least in my experience, have been forward thinking. It was Chief Justice Rose Byrd, who over 30 years ago, instituted the first study on gender fairness in the judicial branch. It was one of her last official acts, but then just Chief Justice Malcolm Lucas saw the importance of that work and carried it through, which resulted in 68 recommendations that were implemented in the 90s to ensure gender fairness. You know, we started with gender fairness, but 20 years later, the Judicial Council adopted as part of its strategic mission, strategic plan, that diversity was in one of its number one goals, access, fairness, and diversity. It was only 16 years ago that we had our first diversity summit with all of the justice stakeholders to bring together lawyers to talk about supporting the governor's effort to create and more diversity writ large on the judiciary. As, just, as Judge Roca said, it meant gender, ethnicity, it meant geographic, it meant experience, it meant veterans, it meant disability. And it continues to that day. The first diversity summit was 16 years ago. It came with a follow-up meeting and now a uh, diversity summit every five years. Also, that was the birth, as you may know, of the Judicial Council Pathways for Achieving Justice Diversity Toolkit that many programs use. We just did the Toolkit 2.0. We don't do it alone. We call on all of you. We call on all of our panelists to help us create this because the judges and the lawyers of this state see the future and the strength and diversity and model it. I'm also proud of the participation in diversity from the Providing Access and Fairness Advisory Committee, the State Bars Access and Fairness Commission, all of the individual work of the judges and lawyers and the bar associations, and today we see the explosive growth. I'm told that there are at least 45 counties in California that have a diversity program. And the Bay Area and the Los Angeles, uh, their programs are bringing together the strength of those programs and making the judiciary additionally more of the powerhouse it is. I don't know of any other branch of government that pursues and knows the strength of diversity than the judiciary. And so I wish you the best and know that we'll only be stronger. And one day I know you'll be saying, I am an unlikely bench officer, appellate justice, chief justice, and it's true, but that's how you model it. Thank you so much for your time, your effort, your work, and your advice. Thank you so much, Chief Justice, for your, your wonderful remarks and for all that you do for the courts in the state of California. You inspire us all. And now it's my honor to introduce to you Secretary Luis Cespedes, Governor Newsom's Judicial Appointment Secretary. Secretary Cespedes, it's yours. Thank you, Judge Roca. Thank you for your leadership. And uh, I wanna express my sincere thanks for the very kind words from Chief Justice 
Tani Cantil Sakauye, who we celebrated at the California Judges Association in Monterey a few months ago for her commitment to diversity, her leadership and vision, and her outstanding commitment to making our judiciary look like California. Thank you very much, Chief, for all that you've done, uh, not only for me, but for our entire state. And uh, we are privileged to have you as the leader of our judiciary. Uh, I had an opportunity recently to chat with uh, former Senator Feingold, who now uh, works uh, in the, um, uh, for the, uh, with the uh, American Constitution Society, and as you know, was a distinguished member of the United States Senate. In our conversation, he commented to me about how California's judicial selection process is so unique. It is the least political, and it's the most intense and it is reflected in the quality of our judiciary. And as I've said often, this is nothing new. Uh, we've always had uh, a dynamic Supreme Court. And uh, those of you who follow trends in the law know that the law goes west to east. It doesn't go east to west. If you take civil rights cases, including desegregation of our schools, if you take protecting consumers and product liability, if you take uh, marriage equality, any of those issues go west to east. And so it's my privilege to encourage all of you to take advantage of this very unique program. Started in Los Angeles, uh, I wanna give absolute credit to my predecessor, uh, Justice Martin Jenkins for his vision and working with uh, the presiding judges there uh, to including current presiding judge Eric Taylor and judge Helen Zukin to launch in October. When I became judicial appointment secretary, right as the program launched, I expressed to the governor that it would be wonderful to move this statewide and perhaps have an appellate judicial mentor program. And so I'm pleased that we have this program statewide moving regionally and also a appellate program that Justice Jenkins has been working on out of a pilot project in the first DCA. I wanna thank Justice Cherry Jackson, Justice Edmund for leading that effort with Justice Jenkins. And also I'd like to express my thanks to Judge Paul Bacigalupo and the other judges on the executive committee. I wanna just very quickly share with you in demystifying the um, process of what we're looking at, but let's start with the law. I, I wanna share with you a uh, statute that uh, when I read it, um, I knew, uh, I actually recalled who had introduced it and it was a friend of mine, for, then Assemblyman David Jones, who went on to the Senate and then became commissioner of uh, insurance. And in government code 1201.5 subsection D, if you read that, it requires, if this is the statute that set up the Jenny Commission, and I wanna share the language with you because many people decide maybe my particular background isn't suitable to go on the bench, but look at what the law says that governs the Jenny Commission, which is the Judicial Nominees Evaluation Commission. It says, in determining the qualifications of a candidate for judicial office, the state bar shall consider among other appropriate factors, his or her industry, judicial temperament, honesty, objective, objectivity, community respect, integrity, health, ability, and legal experience. The state bar shall consider legal experience broadly, including but not limited to litigation and non-litigation experience, legal work for a business or a nonprofit entity, experience as a law professor or other academic position, legal work in any of the three branches of government and legal work in dispute resolution. Now, the reason the legislature, legislature put that in as shell is because they wanted to uh, let the, the Jenny Commission know to weigh all of these factors equally. And so when we uh, look at an application that comes to us, uh, first of all, we review all the applications in the PDQ, which is the personal data questionnaire, about 70 plus questions. It takes a while to fill out. Uh, it's not who you know that gets the attention of the governor, reread all of them. 
And uh, very simply, after we review and we make some de preliminary determinations, uh, we have established the governor and Justice Jenkins in 2019 uh, decided to make our what used to be called the secret committees actually transparent. And we have eight judicial selection advisory committees chosen by the governor of distinguished lawyers and judges and, and, and people who have uh, served uh, in, in almost all three branches of government. And they are in eight uh, different uh, jurisdictions. Uh, the Bay Area has their JSAC, Northern California, San Diego, and so on. The JSACs uh, will be the often the first review after we do our initial review. So you can go to uh, Governor Newsom uh, press release JSAC and click that box and you can find the names of all of the persons that will do an initial review. Uh, they do not do interviews, but they will review contact almost every lawyer listed in any of your 10 important cases and other judges that know you and your references. Um, they will usually assign two people to each candidate and they'll give us a rating of EWQ, exceptionally well-qualified, well-qualified, qualified, or don't send yet, maybe need more seasoning, or there are other reasons why they recommend that we not go to the Jenny Commission. I just read you the statute. If you're really interested, read that statute, Government Code 12011, which establishes the Judicial Nominees Evaluations Commission. Now this commission, I just spoke to them recently. They have new members uh, coming in every periodically. Um, the chairman uh, was Stella Nye and now is Mr. Adam Hoffman. And the commissioners will serve um, and the, the, we have 90 days. They have 90 days to return evaluations. They send out about a thousand questionnaires. They do a very intense and deep dive into the character and background of the candidates. And they again will review, uh, send us a written report on whether it is a person is EWQ, WQQ, or not qualified. Uh, if you're not qualified, you have appellate rights uh, that, are, uh, are, that are part of the rules of court. Uh, I'm sorry, the rules of the Jenny Commission. Uh, simultaneously, we have relationships with county bars, not all of them, but the county bars will also do an interview. Some of them do the judicial advisory committees for each bar, and then we get those reports. So the three entities that will be vetting candidates before we do our thorough vetting, um, and, and that vetting, by the way, occurs concurrently, uh, is again the JSAC, Judicial Selection Advisory Committee, that's now transparent, the Jenny Commission, and the county bars. After we review all of those records, um, I like to say, as Ronald Reagan said, you know, I trust, but I verify, and our office will look very deeply, uh, particularly if there's criticisms on the context and whether these criticisms uh, merit any serious uh, review. Uh, we will select persons based on the governor's values on who to interview. And I wanna share with you in my last comments, cause I know I only have 10 minutes, what these values are. The governor has said very clearly on numerous occasions that we are looking for people from diverse backgrounds. And of course, diversity in the big D and the little D. The little D is what I just read. The big D of course, is making sure that the judiciary reflects uh, California. And those values are humility and empathy, intelligence and intellectual curiosity, integrity and honesty, civic mindedness and community involvement, a strong work ethic, people who have demonstrated courage, especially when things have not gone well in one's life or in one's profession. And above all, uh, well, excellent communication and people skills. Uh, judicial temperament is defined in a number of ways, but more importantly, an unwavering commitment to public service. Judicial officers play a unique role in our society, and the governor has said this on numerous occasions. You control uh, so much of people's lives, and you decide whether someone is going to serve an extended time in prison. You will decide who gets ch child custody, whether a parent should be separated from their child, 
and whether someone should go to a collaborative court or be severely punished for uh, various crimes. It's an important and noble and honorable profession. And indeed, uh, the judiciary, as Hamilton said, and as we learned after January 26th, is the cornerstone of our democracy. We encourage all of you to take advantage of the Judicial Mentor Program and to join the hundreds of lawyers and judges who have moved from the trial court to the appellate court, maybe the Supreme Court, who have committed themselves to the rule of law, to justice, fairness, and equal protection. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Cespedes, for your insight and your tireless efforts to promote a judiciary truly, truly reflective of all of the state of California. And I've watched you go from meeting to meeting, place to place, talking about this. I don't know when you ever get to go home. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Now, our next two speakers are going to address key portions of the vetting process that were referenced by uh, Secretary Cespedes, the Jenny Commission, and the local bar association. We don't have anyone here to talk about JSAC, but we can answer questions about that as well later on in the program during the question and answer session. So I'd first like to introduce to you the former chair of the State Bar of California's Commission on Judicial Nominee Evaluations, Judge Andrew Steckler of the Alameda County Superior Court. Thank you, Judge Roca. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this very important program and among this very esteemed uh, panel this evening. Um, once you've pressed submit on your application uh, to become a judge or to be considered, or, or even before, you could do this now, I suggest you go to calbar.org, put JNE for Jenny in the search um, uh, box, and you can peek at the roster of the 36 members of the Jenny Commission. And uh, more importantly, you can read the rules and procedures. It's just over 14 pages. And if you do that, then you'll have at your fingertips essentially what I'm about to tell you now. I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail uh, in, uh, about the Jenny process um, than um, Secretary Cespedes just did. The Jenny Commission confidentially investigates and evaluates the judicial qualifications of those identified by the governor for consideration of appointment to the bench. A Jenny investigation is required before the governor can make an appointment. The process is essentially um, the governor sends a list of those he's considering for appointment to the Jenny Commission. Once it receives the list, Jenny must commence an investigation of everyone on that list, the end results, result of which is a two to three page report sent to the governor um, for each candidate. When, once the list is received from the uh, governor's office, the Jenny chair assigns two Jenny commissioners per trial court candidate one of whom is designated as the lead commissioner. The lead telephones the candidate. This is the, uh, the happy call. Clears conflicts uh, between the candidate, any conflicts that may be between the candidate and the two investigating commissioners. Sets a date for the interview, which is approximately two months out, that varies and requests a list of the names and contact information, I think currently it's emails, of everyone listed in the PDQ and 50 to 75 uh, personals, uh, people who know your qualifications uh, for the position not listed in the PDQ. The lead then confers with the co-commissioner to determine the rest of the mailing list and who's responsible for what part of the mailing list to send out those confidential comment forms. Uh, the rules tell Jenny, quote, to the extent feasible, the list must reflect a broad cross-section of attorneys who practice the same types of law as the candidate and where the candidate practices. There are some requirements. Uh, for example, all judges in the county, except for Los Angeles, um, and all 
um, or 50 uh, DAs or defenders if it's a criminal law practitioner, uh, for example. Once uh, the lists are compiled, the CCFs, confidential comment forms, are sent out. The two investigating commissioners monitor responses. They must make reasonable efforts to contact um, the raters. Those are the people who send in the confidential comment forms with comments. Uh, to contact them, those who provide any negative feedback. All right, and this brings me to rule 7.50, which is kind of a critical rule in the Jenny rules. Um, this requires that at least four days before the interview date, um, corroborated, substantial and credible adverse allegations must be disclosed to the candidate as specifically as possible without breaching confidentiality required by the rules. So they have to be deemed substantial and credible and they have to be corroborated. Most of these uh, derive from CCFs when they come. Some may derive from the PDQ itself, for example, lacking certain types of uh, experience if that's deemed to be given as a, as a negative. Um, this telephone call, which must be made at least four days before the interview is oftentimes not as happy a call, but it's not an insurmountable event. Um, then, is the interview. You prepare for the interview, you've received any negatives. Um, the interview is just you, the candidate, and the two Jenny com investigating commissioners. And you have the opportunity then to respond however you would like to um, address any of the criticisms. Now, when, when I would, you know, just over 10 years ago, when I was the chair, we had um, three ways commissioners would resolve these uh, criticisms. It was, they were either sustained, adequately addressed or refuted. And uh, that's what got forwarded. Um, Secretary Cespedes can confirm uh, the current uh, nomenclature and how it's resolved. The interview, um, after the candidate addresses any negatives, um, can be a wide ranging discussion. It could take a couple hours um, and it can include any, in the, any of the information in the PDQ. You also get to hear about all of the um, the positive feedback that will have been received um, from your community. At the end of the interview, you leave. The commissioners discuss your candidacy and in the interview and everything else. They arrive at, together or separately, a rating from exceptionally, exceptionally well-qualified on down through well-qualified, qualified, or not qualified. The team of two then reports to the full commission a week or two after that, maybe three weeks, at a weekend meeting. It's a Friday or Saturday meeting uh, at which all of the governor's list for that time period, uh, all candidates are discussed by the full Jenny Commission. Each one is discussed one at a time. After a report from the team, then the full Jenny Commission votes on the candidate. The candidate receives a rating from the Jenny Commission based on that discussion and vote as above, exceptionally well qualified on down. A report is written and sent to the governor along with the rating. You can obtain a review of a not qualified rating. You will not hear anything from Jenny uh, if it's qualified or higher. So no news is good news is what you'll hear at the end of your interview. And that's well past my designated five minutes. Basic Jenny overview. Thank you very much, Judge Steckler. It's appreciated you're demystifying the Jenny process. While, while not all counties have local bar association vetting committees, many do have them. Now let me introduce you to my friend and immediate past president and former chair of the Judiciary Committee of the Bar Association of San Francisco, Mr. Anderson, Marvin Anderson, to talk about the Bar Association of San Francisco's judicial applicant vetting process. Thank you, uh, Judge Roca, for inviting me to participate on this panel. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege. Um, much of what I have to say uh, follows closely on 
uh, Judge Steckler's comments. Uh, but let me just say at the outset that the role of the local uh, county vetting bar association judiciary committee uh, is for San Francisco governed uh, completely by uh, uh, sections of the bylaws that are publicly available on the Bar Association, Association of San Francisco's website. And um, every um, applicant who is evaluated by the committee um, is offered the opportunity to refer uh, to, the, to the details in those bylaws and the Judiciary Committee follows closely the process that is laid out in those bylaws. So I absolutely commend to you to pull down um, those bylaws from the Bar Association of San Francisco's website. So at a, at a very high level, um, the role of the local county, the Bar Association Vetting Committee uh, for appointments to be made by the governor uh, will receive from um, a secretary like Secretary Cespedes uh, names. And those names will come to the committee and the committee uh, will discharge its responsibilities consistent with the bylaws. Uh, the members are selected by the local bar. The members of the Judiciary Committee are sworn to, not sworn to secrecy, but acknowledge and agree that its um, proceedings are confidential. And the committee will review the uh, PDQ, which the applicant would already have filled out, um, and then commence to investigate the references and contact the judges, the lawyers, the community members, and other individuals who are listed in the application. Uh, members of the Judiciary Committee um, owe a duty of fidelity to the committee and are um, nonpartisan and nonpolitical in their participation um, on the Judiciary Committee. So uh, no campaign assistance is allowed to anyone who is seeking um, um, an appointment uh, to the bench. You can't be on anyone's campaign committee or, or actively involved in, in contributing money or anything like that. Um, you must be non-political and partisan in your work for the Judiciary Committee for the Bar Association of San Francisco. Um, the applicant um, will be interviewed after the committee has uh, completed its investigation and the applicant uh, will come in for the interview and uh, be greeted by the committee and basically answer questions based on the results of the investigation. And the, and the questions can be from all different sources and different places and the committee will uh, evaluate how the applicant responds and answers. We'll evaluate the applicant's demeanor, um, assess the integrity, um, and after the interview, we'll then have a discussion, again, all confidential, and then take a vote. And the vote will be um, primarily aligned with rating the applicant on, on his or her qualifications, um, qualified, well qualified, as noted by Judge Steckler. After that, the results of the vote is delivered to the candidate and then reported to the governor's office. And that pretty much concludes the um, the, the work of the Judiciary Committee for an applicant who uh, has been recommended uh, by the governor's office. For those folks seeking appointment to, not appointment to the bench, but who seek 
to um, become a judge in San Francisco, the committee has under its bylaws, the opportunity to ask for uh, an interview and do an investigation of a candidate uh, who uh, chooses to run for that office. And the bylaws provide for um, a similar process and a similar procedure uh, for those individuals. And it's not just as the Superior Court um, that is cared for in the bylaws and the work of the Judiciary Committee. Um, any person who is seeking to um, become a member of a court in San Francisco, such as to the federal judge or um, appellate justice or the California Supreme Court, our bylaws provide for the Judiciary Committee to, be, to become involved and conduct an evaluation process uh, for those individuals. So um, I'm gonna stop there. And if any of our viewers have any specific questions about the um, process that we use here in San Francisco, I'll be happy to try to answer those questions. Thank you, Judge Roca. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Anderson. So very much for all your contributions to the community we serve. So much, very much appreciated. Um, finally, I'm pleased to introduce to you the Honorable Judge Nahal Irvani Sani from the Santa Clara County Superior Court. Judge Irvani Sani will share her career path and the importance of mentoring, and then she'll pivot and describe the key points in the Bay Area Judicial Mentor Program. Judge? Thank you very much, Judge Roca. Good evening, everyone. We hope you found the program to be informative so far. We are certainly invigorated by the early interest that has been shown. Uh, there's 176 of you here tonight, and that's just here in the Bay Area. Even though we can't see your faces and your names, and we purposely did it that way, uh, we're very invigorated by your interest in joining the California bench. Some of you may have had the dream of being a judge ever since you were in grade school, and others of you may have developed it somewhere along the line in law school or through your practice, and others of you may just be curious, tiptoeing and kind of looking before you leap. I certainly fell in the latter category. I certainly didn't have any goals of being a judge when I was growing up, uh, even in undergrad or law school or for the duration of my career at the DA's office locally in Santa Clara County. It wasn't um, an aspiration. And when people towards the end of my career at the DA's office, I was there for 22 years, toward the later years, a lot of judges and uh, former colleagues, even opposing counsel, would encourage me to apply for the bench. I would always say, thank you so much. I appreciated the vote of confidence. I took it to heart, but I would bow out. Why? Uh, I had plenty of trial experience, I had uh, leadership roles, I had community service, the, all the necessary ingredients, but I would always shy away. And when I th think about why uh, I would bow out, it's because I think oftentimes when you see someone that looks like you and their background resonates with you, you think, you know, that's something that I want to do someday. Uh, consciously or subconsciously, it kind of becomes a goal to aspire to. But when you don't see anyone that looks like you, you kind of self-select out. And uh, there were no Iranian Americans on our bench in Santa Clara County or even in nearby counties uh, that I knew of throughout the state of California for the majority of my career. And so when people would encourage me, I would just get in my own way. I would self-select out. What got me to finally um, 
think about it more seriously, I have to give a lot of credit to former presiding judge Brian Walsh. Uh, prior to him becoming PJ in our court, I used to appear in his department, had several serious felony trials. Uh, we got to know each other at local bar association events and community events. And Judge Walsh in earnest had a series of conversations with me and started explaining the process, answered a lot of my questions, a lot of the same questions that are coming in through the uh, chat or through the Q&A here, which we will address later, um, alleviated a lot of my doubts and just really took the time to explain the process. It was uh, an informal mentorship. There was no formal judicial mentorship program back in 2016 when I was having these conversations with Judge Walsh, uh, but his mentorship really, really uh, influenced my decision to ultimately apply. And had it not been for that mentorship experience, I probably would not be standing before you today. So fast forward to 2021, uh, last year, the Governor Newsom's office and uh, also throughout the state, we collaborated to come up with this judicial mentorship program and to basically level the playing field and provide mentors for anyone who's interested. It's not fair if someone doesn't have a Judge Walsh in their life, but they have all these questions. Uh, so we want to make sure to play the role that Judge Walsh did for me, for any of you that are interested in applying for the bench and have a lot of questions. We are absolutely committed to uh, recruiting and developing a highly qualified and inclusive judicial applicant pool uh, for representing the diversity, the rich diversity that our state enjoys. Now, First step is for you, again, I emphasize the point, do not self-select out. Once you decide to uh, finally not get in your own way, let me review with you some of the program uh, requirements, minimum requirements, what you can expect and what you can't expect. So we'll rely from our tech team to bring up the slide. There we go. Okay, so the applicant must meet the following requirements. Uh, uh, you have to have practiced in California for at least 10 years. That is the minimum requirement by the governor's office to be eligible for appointments. You have to have uh, been an attorney for a minimum of 10 years. For mentorship, I saw a question come in. For mentorship, it's less depending on the county that you're applying in. I believe the range that we're selecting is somewhere between eight to 10 years, depending on the county, so that if you have such aspirations, it gives you two years to uh, be mentored, talk to a judge, develop your personal data questionnaire, and then apply if you're trying to get in right at the minimum mark of the 10-year experience. Next, uh, you have to be licensed to practice in the state of California and be in good standing with the state bar. That's somewhat obvious, goes without saying. Uh, you have to be a California attorney and with a uh, good standing. You also have to be committed to public service. If you think about it, the judiciary is the ultimate public service in the legal profession. Um, so even if you're not a public service attorney, obviously, if you're a private practitioner, you're encouraged to apply, uh, but you have to be committed and dedicated to public service. And you can definitely show that by some of the uh, extracurricular or community service activities that you do. Sorry, not much uh, <laughs> movement. I have to move to get the light to come back on. Okay. Um, you also uh, must not have previously applied for judicial appointment. So if you've previously applied, you know the process, you figured it out on your own, and there's really not much more that the mentorship can do for you. But if you haven't already applied, then uh, we encourage you to take advantage of this mentorship. Okay, now what to expect from the Judicial Mentorship Program. It's a one year mentorship and you can expect to have about a quarterly 
meetings with your mentor. This uh, mentorship can be either in person, if times allow it, hopefully all of these orders will be lifted soon, um, virtually or by phone, approximately four times a year as you come up with uh, what works between you and your mentor. Your mentor will explain the various stages of the judicial appointment process. Our uh, speakers tonight, Judge Seckler and Mr. Anderson, uh, did a wonderful job um, already explaining some of the details, but you'll go into a lot more detail with your mentor. Your mentor will uh, review your personal data questionnaire. That's the PDQ uh, that Secretary Suspedes mentioned that has, I remember when I applied, it had 74 questions. I don't know how many we have now, but 70 plus questions. Your mentor, uh, you can expect to make suggestions for making your application stronger, uh, but please don't expect any proofreading or any editing from your mentor. Your mentor will review your PDQ and perhaps tell you, you know, on this particular question, why don't you provide more specific anecdote? Or on this particular question, you're not so strong in your application. Maybe you can do some uh, temporary judging, or maybe you can do more community service. So they can give you that type of feedback to bolster your application, but please don't expect any uh, editing or proofreading. Now, what not to expect uh, sorry, I also have to mention that the relationship is completely confidential um, unless there's a waiver by you. So for the same reason that we did not uh, show your faces here in case you are a little bit shy about it and don't want anybody to know that you're even interested, for the same reason, the relationship is confidential. We won't disclose it to the governor's office. We won't disclose it to your current employment or to anyone unless there's a specific waiver by you. What not to expect from the program, this is not an inside track for appointments. So don't think that if you go through the mentorship program, it's a prerequisite check and you're gonna get an endorsement from your mentor and that appointment is guaranteed. That's not the case. This is just really to mentor you through the process. It's not a prerequisite, it's not an endorsement and it's no guarantee of appointment. And there will be no mock interviews you already heard that there will be interviews with perhaps the local bar association or the Jenny Commission, and then ultimately with the secretary. Your mentor is not to conduct any mock interviews with you. We want it to be you and authentically you. And imagine if all of you, you know, went through this mentorship and there was these canned answered answers, it just would not seem authentic. So for that reason, uh, please don't expect any mock interviews. Now, I should also um, mention that recently the California, the, I wanna make sure that I get the uh, acronym right, the Commission on Judicial Ethics Advisory Opinions came up with the opinion uh, recognizing that sometimes this uh, mentor-mentee relationship may create an, uh, an appearance of uh, impartiality or uh, impropriety or conflict of interest. And so they opined that it's best not to be mentored by someone that you routinely appear in front of, which makes perfect sense. So, um, let me first point to this map since that screen is up. The partnership that we have with the California Judicial Mentorship Program is within these states, Alameda, Contra Costa, these counties, sorry, Alameda, Contra Costa, Monterey, San Benito, San Francisco, San Mateo, Santa Cruz, and Santa Clara counties. We recognize that some of these counties are smaller counties. For example, San Benito only has one judge. Uh, Santa Cruz County has, uh, I believe, less than 10 judges. And so if you apply for mentorship to one of these counties, uh, and there is a conflict of interest because it's small or they don't have enough judges uh, to mentor you, they will send your application to one of the other counties. Santa Clara, for example, um, has taken on the 
uh, responsibility for mentoring for San Benito, Santa Cruz, or Monterey, if that is appropriate. You only submit one application to the county that you wish to serve in, and then trust that with our collaboration and our partnership, we will assign a mentor to you if that is what's most appropriate. Uh, we can finish the slide. Um, and so I was saying about the conflict of interest that may arise. If you routinely practice in the civil division of your court, for example, we will be mindful of that potential conflict of interest and we will pair you up with a judge in the criminal division. Or if you routinely practice family law, we will pair you up with a judge in a different division to avoid that conflict of interest. Uh, I think that makes perfect sense. Uh, for example, if your judge, your mentor judge is mentoring you in the evening and then the next day having to uh, decide on your motions eliminate, it might seem unfair um, and it might create a conflict of interest. So when we're doing the pairing, we will recognize and abide by the advisory opinion. We're now going to set, open it up to questions. I know some have been coming in and uh, we will uh, answer them depending on which speaker you address it to or Judge Roca will uh, answer the majority. Thank you again uh, very much for your continued interest. And thank you very much, Judge Irani Sani. That was very useful, very, it said a lot. So let's now go to questions. Uh, I think somebody's going to be pitching questions to us. I think that's me. That's Judge Robert Gordon from the San Francisco Superior Court. Welcome. It is, it is. And thank you to all of our panelists and to all of um, our participants. I have had the task of trying to stay on top of your questions and they're wonderful and have been so much interest, which is terrific. So let's, let's sort of start with this one. Um, and I think honestly, Secretary Cespedes, Mr. Anderson, Judge Steckler, frankly, any of you would be, or all would be terrific. A few people wonder if they maybe did a little bit of litigation 20, 30 years ago and then became a managing attorney either for government or for an in-house counsel. Is that enough litigation experience or should they bother um, applying? I would suggest the Secretary Cespedes responded respond to that question. I think I know his answer, but go ahead, Secretary. Yes. Legal experience broadly, it's in the statute. Absolutely. Yes. That's an easy one. <laughs> I join. <laughs> I knew that was gonna be the answer, but there you go. All right, Secretary Cespedes, sorry to put you on the spot, but I- No, I mean, I, I'm, I'm loving this by the way. Awesome, I think this one has, you know, is good. So what advice would you have? And I think there are others who can answer this for candidates who have applied maybe more than once under different administrations, should they give up? Um, yeah, uh, that's an easy one too. No, <laughs> let me just be very clear. Um, we have had uh, judges in the year that I've been judicial appointment secretary who applied uh, a couple of times and never had a Jenny interview. And um, there, there may be a number of reasons why they weren't selected early in their applications. There have been chains of circumstances and there's been other factors, but uh, we I've seen it on, on a number of occasions. Um, obviously, um, if there is a problem uh, that has arisen, um, if you have been referred to Jenny by a prior administration, um, there, there, there could be some issues that uh, we would have to uh, look at very carefully, but um, I have seen, we've had folks to have, who have run uh, in, in try, and, and for judge in an open contested seat and then applied um, in our process. So uh, I would, it would be case specific, but uh, the fact that you've applied in a, in a, in, in the Brown administration, uh, I would, and you still want to serve, 
uh, I, I, that is not a bar. Anyone else want to add to that? Okay, I take this as an important question because I know we're all interested in, um, in diversifying the bench. And I do think, let's just say this one resonates with me. How does, perhaps this is for Judge Steckler, Jenny consider gaps in employment? And the person is specifically talking about time off to care for one's children or to have children in the first place. I saw that question um, earlier in the chat. And so um, one way to answer that is you, you may have 36 different opinions on that. You know, everyone votes their conscience once the candidate has been discussed at the full Jenny Commission. I, you know, I, it, it's, you know, I think the way to answer that is um, there's an explanation for everything. If there's a good reason for it, I think it can be addressed in the interview. And you know, a gap is not necessarily um, something that's going to be seen as a deficiency or even a negative thing. It depends. So you know, there's uh, certainly that is not a disqualifier by any stretch of the imagination. If I could respond to that question as well, I agree with the judge. Uh, no question about that. Uh, let me put it in the context of community service, which I. I also identified. I mean, let's be very candid. Uh, women in particular continue to have a disproportionate amount of responsibilities in the family, uh, responsibilities at home and their careers. And if there's gaps in, in both their commitment to uh, bar activities or community service, and it's because they're raising children, uh, we, we look at that uh, as a favorable uh, because one's commitment to their family, one's commitment to their child rearing. We've often had folks who have had special needs children and women in particular should not feel like a gap in their community service or a gap in their uh, careers um, is going to be looked at from our perspective negatively. I agree that we would have to analyze the very specifics about why that occurred. Uh, but I, uh, I know uh, many, many prominent uh, judges, even on the federal bench, who have taken time off to raise their children. And when asked about that before the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, it has been favorably received. Uh, I know at least two uh, federal district court judges where that occurred. And I think we recognize uh, that. And I might also add uh, on the question of bias or implicit bias, we didn't talk about it, but the Jenny Commission is required and they do uh, get specific training on bias and implicit bias. And sometimes in the past, and it's the not too distant past, these kinds of questions would come up and there would be either express bias or implicit bias. And uh, we, we have worked very hard uh, recently to make sure that we look at candidates in the totality and we contextualize and analyze the reasons for it and to eliminate any uh, overt or covert bias, implicit or express bias. And that is a fundamental uh, responsibility of to the Jenny Commission, our JSACs, the county bars and our office to eliminate bias in, where it exists. And this is a, a implied in that question. I would also add, thank you, Secretary. I would also add that during the interview process, uh, be prepared to have a story to tell, uh, to talk about uh, the quote unquote gap, if you will. Uh, you should not be blindsided with questions about what, what you were doing in that time. And then also what brought you back to the law um, or the community service um, afterwards. And uh, I would just close with, you need not frame it in terms of making an apology, if you will, because you're certainly entitled to live your life and raise your family and have children and so forth. So just be prepared to have a story to tell uh, during the interview process. Thank you.
Uh, Judge Roca, how are we on time? Well, we're, we're a little over, but I'm comfortable so long as the panel is to go at, take a few more questions before we adjourn. I know it's, a, it's an evening and people have places to go and I respect that. So a couple more questions. Okay, there's, how about two? So, um, and I wanna thank everyone for their answers to that last question. It's particularly important to me. I will just put it out there. I have two children and I worked very, very hard and I raised them. They are now, you know, older teenagers. And um, I didn't, thank you, but you know, I didn't have, I, I took time off with them and I didn't have any extra time between working 60 hours a week, right? And raising them to go be part of various things that were supposed to make me appealing as a judge. So thank you to everyone showing that you didn't need to. But let's say I- Sorry, I just have to chime in on that as well. Um, there were several years in the middle of my career where I worked part-time when uh, we had our children. And when the call came from Jenny, where they, the bad call, where they review the not so favorable part, questions from some of the uh, critiques was, well, you know, didn't have high profile cases or made family a priority. Um, it all worked out ultimately, but I just want to say to people that take some time off for parenthood or work part-time, don't worry, uh, this governor and this appointment secretary will not frown upon that. Thank you. So thank you. But if for those of us who maybe are at the beginning, well, so I can't even put myself in this category, I'm way too old, but for people who are young and at the beginning of their careers, who are thinking that um, they would like to apply in the future, uh, there were a number of questions, Mr. Anderson, about how should they work with their bar associations? Do they have to, if they want to, how should they do this? Thank you uh, for asking that question, whoever asked it. Uh, number one, from my perspective, is follow your interests. Please do not go out there and think you have to follow some checklist and if you do it exactly according to your checklist that you got from somewhere, that that will somehow uh, advance you in this process. Be who you are, be your authentic self. If you pursue things that you are interested in, then your contributions to those activities will matter far, far more and be more valuable to you and, and will show the person that you are so with respect to the local bar association here in San Francisco, there are many, many opportunities to be engaged in the bar from being a section leader, uh, participating in a conference of bar delegates, to even serving on our board of directors. We have three boards available, the big board, as they say, the bar association board, the nonprofit board, the Justice and Diversity Center, as well as our tremendous and outstanding board of young lawyers to barristers the Barishes Club board of, um, of uh, board members. So, um, if, and also um, <laughs> uh, you can feel free to reach out to me through the Bar Association, if you will. I'll be happy to point you uh, to even more opportunities um, uh, in, in leadership and just plain old member participation. Any of those things, uh, are of import and do matter. And I uh, should also point out that in our bylaws, one of the primary questions that comes from the uh, governor's office in reviewing an applicant being referred to the local bar is what is that uh, individual's history and contribution to the local bar association? And, and, and oftentimes it is something as available as serving on, uh, serving on one of our sections, lit, lit, litigation section or family law section or things of that nature. I mean, all are available to highlight your interest and uh, fill out who you are as a person so that the folks who are evaluating you uh, can make an informed decision and an informed judgment. I hope that answer is helpful. Thank you. Thank Last, you. Question. Last question. Is there any guidance on how long the application process might take? 
I, let, let me let me answer that question and uh, you know it really depends um, on frankly your county in San Benito County for example we only have two judges and when one judge is gone we need to fill that right away uh, same thing with uh, some of the rural counties um, but I mentioned San Benito because you're your part uh, and so we we are looking at to fill vacancies obviously uh, as as quickly as possible. Uh, we do, there is a time, uh, as, as we noted in the Jenny process, it's 90 days for a turnaround. Um, it does take time and uh, we continually vet. So people think that their application is just sitting. It really isn't. We do de do an extensive review and there isn't really a, a beginning and an end in terms of when folks might anticipate you may find that somebody applies and they're appointed immediately. Again, there were exigent circumstances uh, for that, and there are a number of reasons why that would occur. But uh, patience, I think, is the word. Once you hit send, try to get back to your lives as, as best as you can, uh, and um, know full well that uh, your application is getting reviewed. Um, even if you're interviewed by me, once we get the final Jenny reports, and our office, it may take additional time. Um, and ultimately it's the governor who makes these choices. And so, and uh, he is uh, very hands-on. He, he asks a lot of questions. He's very engaged. As some of you know, his father served with distinction on the first uh, uh, district court of appeal, Justice William Newsom and, and the Placer County trial court. This governor is very familiar with uh, you know, the role of a judge. And uh, so it does take time. And, but I would say patience, uh, perseverance. Uh, one other thing, uh, when you have a change in circumstance, let's say you have, you're promoted or there's been a major new case that you've litigated, feel free to update your PDQ. And you would do that by sending any uh, updates to uh, Debbie Kuhn, uh, debbie.kuhn, uh, C-U-N at gov.ca.gov and just indicate what those updates are. And that's that's important. For some of you who are younger attorneys, another tip I would give, uh, this comes from Judge Gaverser in Sacramento County Superior Court, who started keeping a diary of all the cases that he was involved in. What was the case number? What was the case about? Who are opposing counsel? Start collecting that data because it is a 74 uh, question PDQ. And you'll be asked about these cases. And if you have a record, it makes it a lot easier for you to go back and fill the PDQ. I thought I'd share that with you, even though it wasn't asked. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I've appreciated uh, the questions. They're very thoughtful. Thank you, Judge Gordon, for fielding the questions for us. And, and uh, thank everybody. I'm so pleased with the attendance. I'm so pleased with the presentation that the speakers gave here today. I wanna to especially thank all of the staff from the various Bay Area courts who helped us, from the Bar Association of San Francisco who helped us. They worked tirely, tirelessly to pull this program together. That includes Margaret Birmingham of the Alameda County Superior Court, Adrian Williams and Mary Bojuani from the San Francisco Superior Court, and Benjamin Rada, the Santa Clara County Superior Court for his artistry in putting together the invitation and Samantha Kui from the Bar Association of San Francisco. So all of them, thank you very much. And for you attendees, I encourage all who are interested in a judicial career, apply to the program and recommend it to others you believe even if you decide you don't want to do so, you know someone you believe would be a qualified member of our judiciary, recommend it to them. Because I think it's gonna, it's gonna be a huge asset to developing a fantastic pool of diverse candidates that's gonna make California proud. Thank you all for being here. We truly appreciate it. Thank you, Judge. Thank you.